Welcome back to the Synthesis of Yoga, the book that changed my life. We are on the fourth chapter, eighth paragraph. This is episode number 20. In the previous episode, Sri Aurobindo once again repeated the idea that the very essence of yoga is the contact of the individual soul with the divine. And in that context, he also brought in the picture of uh, various steps of evolution nature has already established in human personality. And the contact with the divine can be established from any of those established formations. And there is a ladder of ascending order, various faculties that are already established by evolution. Now today, in this episode, we will be exploring Hatha Yoga in more details. We are on the eighth paragraph of the fourth chapter and there is a link in the description where you can get the soft copy of this book and I highly recommend you follow the text along with my illustrations. So let's begin. Hatha Yoga aims at the conquest of the life and the body whose combination in the food sheath and the vital vehicle constitutes, as we have seen, the gross body and whose equilibrium is the foundation of all nature's working, workings in the human being. So he's bringing back that notion of the sthula sharira, the gross body, where there are two layers meeting, the food sheath and the vital vehicle. And equilibrium between the two is the foundation upon which the rest of our personality and our inner growth, our spiritual growth, everything is built upon this equilibrium of the material body and the life energy coming together, the annamaya, pranamaya, kosha coming together. So Hatha Yogins uses the con looks at the conquest of the body and uses this frame as the starting point for the contact, the contact with the divine and conquer the higher realms of possibility. So Hatha Yoga aims at the conquest of the life and the body, whose combination in the food sheath and the vital vehicle constitutes, as we have seen, the gross body, and whose equilibrium is the foundation of all nature's workings in the human being. The equilibrium established by nature is sufficient for the normal egoistic life. It is insufficient for the purposes of the Hatha Yogi. So there is a working equilibrium that is well established for a normal life of regular survival and living a normal routine life. So we have a limited set of energy that is just enough to run the normal life. That is not sufficient for a Hatha Yogic approach where you have to intensify the energy and contact the divine consciousness from the body, through the body. So the established equilibrium is highly insufficient for that purpose. So let me read again. The equilibrium established by nature is sufficient for the normal egoistic life. Egoistic life is 
a life that is centered around I, me, and myself and my needs. Central reference for the ego is oneself and its conservation, its preservation. And particularly when it comes to bodily life, there is a conservative inertia and ego holds it together. And the equilibrium is just serving that holding of the egoistic life. So is, in, is sufficient for the normal egoistic life, it is insufficient for the purpose of the Hatha Yogi. For it is calculated on the amount of vital or dynamic force necessary to drive the physical engine during the normal span of human life and to perform more or less adequately the various workings demanded of it by the individual life inhabiting this frame and the world environment by which it is conditioned. So this equilibrium that is established is on one hand it is conditioned by the environment in which it is living. On the other hand, the expected function it is meant to serve. For it is calculated on the amount of vital or dynamic force necessary to drive the physical engine. Interesting usage, physical engine. Our material body with its life energy functions more or less mechanically, like a machine, like an engine. Even our heart is pumping blood like an engine. So the amount of vital or dynamic force necessary to drive the physical engine during the normal span of human life. We have roughly, say, 100 years of lifespan. How to sustain life? So we have come with that equilibrium necessary for this lifespan and that's how it is calculated. The nature's engineering calculated the balance of matter and life energy working together as a bundle for a lifespan of 100 years and the normal functions it will serve. This is how this engine of action, the material frame, has been designed by nature. For it is calculated on the amount of the of vital or dynamic force necessary to drive the physical engine during the normal span of human life and to perform more or less adequately, more or less adequately, not even necessary to function in its excellence, adequately. Most people don't even realize their creative potential, even for a normal life, lives in a suboptimal level just in an adequate way to manage, perform more or less adequately the various workings demanded of it. There are all kinds of life contexts where the body has to function demanding challenges, whether it is the sudden need to run, body need to have that surplus energy, or climb, or sit for long hours to do some particular work or repeat certain activities continuously for hours and hours and hours. It is just enough to manage the normal life activities, whether it is cooking, running your regular business activities, doing your farming, all kinds of regular activities. This is good enough. So perform more or less adequately the various workings demanded of it by the individual life inhabiting this frame. It's another interesting imagery. Individual life inhabiting this frame. Frame is the material structure, physical, chemical structure, outwardly visible as our skeletal structure, muscular structure, the whole systems that are packaged within that. So, the individual life is inhabiting this frame. There is a life inhabiting this material frame. When life leaves, 
the material frame disintegrates. So these are two layers. So the individual life inhabiting this frame and the world environment by which it is conditioned. So there is this world environment which supplies its air, its food, and demands activities from this individual. And there is a conditioning done by that. And there is a normal set of activities to be performed by the body. So there is a working equilibrium established by nature through its environment, through its expected function, the normal functioning. Hatha Yoga therefore seeks to rectify nature and establish another equilibrium by which the physical frame will be able to sustain the inrush of an increasing vital or dynamic force of prana, indefinite, almost infinite in its quantity or intensity. Here, this is almost like technology. So there is electricity in nature. It, there is a natural electricity flowing through matter, the material world. That's natural. But when we extract that electricity by different ways, whether it is through windmills or dams, hydroelectric, wind power, whatever be, be the way we harness that energy, it is no more the natural flow of energy, but we are taking the forces of nature so that we can use the electrical energy to run our machinery, to light our bulbs, all that are possible. So a Hatha Yogin, in a similar way, goes beyond the normal workings of nature. He is tapping into, he rectify nature. Hatha Yoga therefore seeks to rectify nature and establish another equilibrium. There's a new equilibrium getting established. Just like our material technologies, physical technologies, establish a new equilibrium of production of electricity and consumption of electricity and the whole cycle. The same way the Hatha Yogin rectifies nature's normal operations and establish a new equilibrium, establish another equilibrium by which the physical frame will be able to sustain the interest of an increasing vital or dynamic force of prana. So, practices that are meant to increase the inrush of energy into this frame so that the frame doesn't break up. Normally, our normal human body, even when there is an inrush of energy into the body, our nervous system gets excited and we throw out the energy in laughter or excitement or restless activities, a compulsion that comes into the physical frame. That's a sign that the body is not able to hold it in equilibrium. For a Hatha Yogin, it is critically important to establish a new equilibrium so that an inrush can be held without a nervous excitement, without an going crazy in the mind, becoming restless, compulsive, all that are to be eliminated when there is a higher inrush. First of all, a Hatha Yogin has to learn to open to a larger influx of energy. Just like our electrical devices are calibrated for a certain flow of electricity, suddenly there is a spike, a higher influx, the machine will burn. The same thing happens to the human body when there is a higher influx of the prana shakti, the life energy into the body, into the nervous system, it can destabilize people. Therefore, the yogic traditions held the transmission of knowledge as quite a protected 
and only to those who are, are trained under the guidance of an established teacher, this knowledge is given and open to the greater possibilities. Otherwise, we see often what is happening is people going mad because there is a higher interest of, of energy and your mind is not trained to handle it. So all kinds of damage can happen to the machinery. And Hatha Yogin has to find a new equilibrium where one can safely receive the energy. Remember the imagery Sri Aurobindo used at one point talking about the sannyasins who act like a one who receives like a lightning rod, it is receiving the lightning of the higher current and protect the edifice of the society. In a similar way here, the Hatha Yogin must learn to receive the energy into the physical frame without losing the equilibrium. And this is, uh, again, something that is beyond the normal asana, pranayama practices that are these days taught. It is essentially to help the body healthy and fit, not necessarily capable of actually opening to a higher inrush of energy into the body. Definitely, it will increase your vitality to a certain extent, but there is a higher intensity of opening to the inrush of prana, and Hatha Yogin aims at that because eventually the physical frame is his means to contact the divine consciousness within the frame, within the physical frame. So establish another equilibrium by which the physical frame will be able to sustain the inrush of an increasing vital or dynamic force of prana, indefinite, almost infinite in its quantity, and intensity. So here Hatha Yogin is aiming at an infinite supply of energy, a higher and higher quantity and intensity of energy. And in order to do that, a new equilibrium is required. And that is one of the conditions that Hatha Yogin set up through their practices. In nature, the equilibrium is based upon the individualization of a limited quantity and force of the prana. More than that, the individual by personal and hereditary habit unable to bear, use or control. So this is the normal equilibrium established by nature. For a particular individual, there is certain hereditary framework the body type that you inherit with its hereditary aspect and which limits what is possible within a given framework. And within that limit, it can bear it, it can use the energy. Any higher level of inrush, it will crack up. There will be a challenge. So the, in nature, the equilibrium is based on the individualization of a limited quantity of prana, quantity and force of prana. So there is a individualization of a limited quantity and force of the prana. More than that, the individual is by personal and hereditary habit. Again, it is a habit. There is even hereditary is a habit. And then there is a personal habit. These habits can be dissolved and one can open up. But there exists a habit. First of all, an inherited habit. And then through personal lifestyle, you create certain habits. And there is a limited energy that you get used to. And that is what is possible within the current configuration, current uh, equilibrium. And that is all what it can bear, use, or control. In Hatha Yoga, the equilibrium opens a door to the universalization of the individual vitality by admitting into the body, containing, using, and controlling a much less fixed and limited action of the universal energy. 
So this energy is universal. Just like electricity is existing in the universe. Everywhere. But within a human body, there is a limited current that is flowing. But Hatha Yogi aims at opening this limitation of the individual small body and its limited current and open to the universal energy and universalize it so that you have an infinite supply and higher current and intensity available. It is pure technology, yogic technology of harnessing energy in the body, through the body, because the body is a limitation and one can open that limitation, open to the universalized state where there is a higher inrush. In Hatha Yoga, the equilibrium opens a door. Equilibrium opens a door to the universalization of the individual vitality. Every individual has a limited vitality that can be opened up and made universal to the universalization of the individual vitality by admitting into the body, containing, using and controlling a much less fixed and limited action of the universal energy. These are higher advanced levels of Hatha Yoga, which we hardly see in these days. Today's Hatha Yoga, the asana practices are predominantly meant for basic health and fitness. It doesn't look beyond that. So in Hatha Yoga, the equilibrium opens a door to the universalization of the individual vitality, universalization of the individual vitality by admitting into the body, containing, using and controlling a much less fixed and limited action of the universal energy. The chief processes of Hatha Yoga are asana and pranayama. So when we are referring to the word Hatha Yoga or Hatha Yoga, these are two major class of practices, asanas and pranayama. I need not explain these things. By its numerous asanas, or fixed postures, it first cures the body of that restlessness, which is a sign of its inability to contain without working them off in action and movement, the vital forces poured into it from the universal life ocean, gives to it an extraordinary health, force and suppleness, and seeks to liberate it from the habits by which it is subjected to ordinary physical nature and kept within the narrow bounds of her normal operations. So a body that is restless cannot contain energy. That's out of question. The very restlessness is a sign that you are not able to contain the energy that is pouring into you. And if you are restlessly compulsive, and if you are someone who cannot sit and hold back the horse, you are bound to be carried away by that restless energy. And in the process, you'll be burned down. And you, your system get burnt, system get destroyed. Damage happens to the system. Even if you have not practiced Hatha Yoga, Asanas and Pranayama, some people are naturally open to a higher influx of energy. Just like electric motors come in various power ratings, 1 HP, 5 HP, 10 HP, 20 HP. The rate of current that is energy that is flowing through the machine, how much the machine can handle without breaking down. So different individuals have different power ratings. People who we say are powerful, 
they are powerful because they have a higher intensity of prana flowing through them and they can hold it without being restless being at peace with that power that is flowing through them whereas an individual with less capacity a little influx of energy extra energy is enough to make them restless so observe is influx of energy making you restless this is one of the thing to learn here and early practices of asana is how to make a posture and be immobile in that posture holding the posture longer and longer without getting tired without getting restless otherwise we get into the nervous tension of having to change the posture it is by its numerous asanas or fixed postures it first cures the body of that restlessness curing the body of that restlessness which is a sign of its inability to contain without working them off in action and movement so our compulsive actions are a ways of releasing the energy that is flowing in so action and movement the vital forces poured into it from the universal life ocean so the life energy the vital energy the prana shakti it exists like an ocean that is all around but by habit the body is receiving a limited influx and by chance if something pours in bit more there is a restlessness and compulsion or somebody who is capable of receiving a higher influx if you have not trained your system you become a compulsive restless person with continuous bouts of anger and stuff like that because there is energy that is trying to flow through you and you are not able to contain it so energy is flowing in from the universal life ocean gives to it an extraordinary health so that's one of the traits when you are able to receive that energy and contain it without restlessness that strong vital energy gives you a robust health so extraordinary health this is one of the first results people get when they do asanas and pranayama your health improves you get good health so extraordinary health force and suppleness you get force because there is a higher level of energy coming into it and because you are able to hold various postures and stretches you get a greater suppleness in the body so gives to it an extraordinary health force and suppleness and seeks to liberate it from the habits on one hand there are existing habits habits of compulsive movement for example all that needs to be overcome and when we practice this systematically we learn to overcome these habits seeks to liberate it from the habits by which it is subjected to ordinary physical nature so in ordinary physical nature our breath has certain established rhythm our heartbeat has certain established rhythm and the whole whole biophysics is working in certain way with its heating and cooling and all that a hatha yogi learns to master these movements and even go beyond the established equilibrium of nature there are people who can even stop their heartbeat people who can increase the heat energy in the body for example those who are in the cold areas in the mountains where there is snow how do you survive there so increasing the heat energy in the body specific practices necessary for it so that the normal equilibrium is overcome and body has a new equilibrium so that you can manage freezing cold so it gives to it an extraordinary health force and suppleness and seeks to liberate it from the habits by which it is subjected to ordinary physical nature and kept within the narrow bounds of the normal operations so within the normal operations we are forced to live by the habitual 
confinement. Hadayogin breaks out of it, establishes a whole new equilibrium. So let me read this long line once again. By its numerous asanas or fixed postures, it first cures the body of that restlessness, by which is a restlessness which is a sign of its inability to contain without working them off in action and movement the vital forces poured into it from the universal life ocean gives to it an extraordinary health force and suppleness and seeks to liberate it from the habits by which it is subjected to ordinary physical nature and kept within the narrow bounds of her normal operations in the ancient tradition of Hatha Yoga, it has always been supposed that this conquest could be pushed so far even as to conquer to a great extent the force of gravitation. Gravity, an established physical law and its force binds all material things. Hatayogins even learn to levitate by overcoming the grip of gravity. So there are many siddhis of the body, making the body as light as possible, or by choice, making the body very heavy. So the density, the weight of the body, the mass of the body, they learn to modify these established equilibrium and open to new possibilities. These are rarely seen these days, but Hatha Yogins have explored this and we have rare examples and literature evidence of the siddhis of the body established by various Hatha Yogins. So in the ancient tradition of Hatha Yoga, it has always been supposed that this conquest, conquest of this established equilibrium, could be pushed so far even as to conquer to a great extent the force of gravitation. By various subsidiary but elaborate processes, the Hatha Yogin next contrives to keep the body free from all impurities and the nervous system unclogged for those exercises of respiration which are his most important instrument. So first is this asana practices that brings the ability to hold the body or cures the body of its restlessness so that the body can be brought into a posture where it can stay long duration without getting restless, without having the need to move. So the posture, holding of the posture longer and longer duration prepares the body for the next one is pranayama practices that is to open the life energy into larger influx. By various subsidiary but elaborate processes, so we know of all kinds of kriyas of purification in Hatha Yoga, where colon is cleansed, all kinds of internal cleansing is done. Various subsidiary but elaborate processes the Hatha Yogi next contrives to keep the body free from all impurities. So there is a purification of the body from all kinds of impurities. So in Ayurveda, we know that the whole theory of Ayurveda of extending the lifespan, it starts with purifying the system, it, removing the impurities from the system, especially the process of digestion where there is all kinds of byproducts that get accumulated in the body, impurities that get accumulated in the body, removing all that. Similarly, Hatha Yogin removes the impurities in the body and 
make the body capable and fit, free from all impurities and the nervous system unclogged. When the nervous system is clogged, it is not able to receive the influx of energy. So the very names of some of the pranayama, it's called Nadi Shuddhi, for example, purification of the Nadi, through which the life current flows through. So nervous system is unclogged for those exercises of respiration, which are his most important instruments. Specific rhythms of respiration, inhalation, exhalation, kumbhaka, the holding of the breath, all that are the methods by which the Hatha Yogin activates the energy in the system. These are called pranayama. Prana, Yama. The control of the breath or vital power. For breathing is the chief physical functioning of the vital forces. The vital force in nature finds its expression in the human body as breath. In breath, out breath. Starting from birth, where we Take the first in-breath, ending with the death, where the last one is exhalation. And in between is the continuous cycle of in-breath and out-breath that keeps the body going. And that is the chief activity in the physical frame of the life of the prana shakti, the life energy in human body. These are called pranayama, the control of the breath or vital power. For breathing is the chief physical functioning of the vital forces. But also, it's good to remember, breathing is just one of the operations of the vital forces, one of the expressions of the vital forces. There are other, more subtler, powerful energies, like electricity in nature, electricity in body. These are more advanced levels, subtler levels of the same energy. Pranayama for the Hatha Yogin serves a double purpose. There's a double purpose for pranayama. First, it completes the perfection of the body. That's the first objective of Hatha Yogin, using pranayama, making the body perfect. First through asanas, making it free from restlessness and then through pranayama, making it healthy, durable, strong. So healthy, fit body is the first condition to be established. So first it completes the perfection of the body. The vitality is liberated from many of the ordinary necessary physical necessities of physical nature. Robust health, prolonged youth, Often an extraordinary longevity are attained. So these are some of the outcome of that practice. So when you liberate, the vitality is liberated from many of the ordinary necessities of the physical nature. What are some of the ordinary necessities of physical nature? A normal human body, by the time it is in its teenage, it's primed for a sexual life and sexual reproduction. And that's how vital energy is spent in creation of new life form through union of male and female. And this is the way the normal life energy is spent. And when you take on the yogic forces, uh, yogic practices, one thing that you do is you learn to conserve these energies so that it is uplifted into higher possibilities. And uh, so these are, for normal man, a sexual impulse is a compulsion and necessity. They cannot go beyond it. It is a biological drive, a nature's drive. You cannot override. Most people cannot override this nature's compulsion. Or even for that matter, hunger. This cannot be held back by normal people. Whereas if you train your body, you can hold the hunger without letting it drive you. 
So hunger for food, comp uh, impulsion for sex, all that is the normal ordinary operations. This can be mastered. So that is one of the first thing. The vitality is liberated from many of the ordinary necessities of physical nature. Robust health, prolonged youth, often extraordinary longevity are attained. So that's the natural outcome of this stage. If the next is, on the other hand, pranayama awakens the coiled up serpent of the pranic dynamism in the vital sheath and opens to the yogin fields of consciousness, ranges of experience, abnormal faculties denied to the ordinary human life while it puissantly intensifies such normal powers and faculties as he already possesses. The coiled up serpent energy referred to as the Kundalini. And this is the master clue of Hatha Yoga and Tantra. It's well known in yogic traditions. There is an energy, a sleep, right at the base of the spine. In the very physical nature, this can be awakened. And the whole practices are oriented towards awakening this energy. So the first is perfection of the body, where youthfulness, energy, longevity, all that are established. Second is this awakening of the Kundalini Shakti, so that it opens the higher fields of consciousness. The coiled up serpent of pranic dynamism, pranic dynamism, in the vital sheath. It is happening in the vital sheath, the pranamaya kosha. Remember, Stula Sarira has these two layers. On the one hand, there is the material frame. On the other hand, there is the nervous energy, the pranamaya layer. It is in that this current flows in the vital sheath and opens to the yogin fields of consciousness, ranges of experience, abnormal faculties. So this awakening of Kundalini brings a whole new range of possibilities, including abnormal faculties, faculties that are normally not accessible to the ordinary human being. So abnormal faculties denied to the ordinary human life while it puissantly intensifies such normal powers and faculties as he already possesses. So on one hand, it opens up new fields of consciousness, new faculties. On the other hand, it makes much more powerful the existing faculties, whether it is power of thought, creativity, any of the imagination, all those powers everything gets amplified by the awakening of the Kundalini Shakti. So, <clears throat> on the other hand, pranayama awakens the coiled up serpent of the pranic dynamism in the vital sheath and opens to the yogin fields of consciousness, ranges of experience, abnormal faculties denied to the ordinary human life while it puissantly intensifies such normal powers and faculties as he already possesses. But mostly when people take up Hatha Yoga, mostly what we approach is the first level of perfection, which is the healthy body, youthfulness of the body, longevity of the body. Very few actually intensely focus on the next level, which is the awakening of the Kundalini Shakti and those higher powers. That requires a lot more concentrated effort, which most people don't put that kind of an effort. And in today's world, when everybody is busy, and particularly Hatha Yoga requires elaborate practices and long periods of practice, to which most people cannot these days put time. So therefore, most limits in the first level of perfection, which is bodily health, vitality, youthfulness, longevity. The second is the awakening of the Kundalini. These advantages can be further secured and emphasized by other subsidiary processes open to the Hatha Yogi. 
So there is more to it. He is just hinting that these advantages, advantages of perfection, two types of perfection, can be further secured and emphasized by other subsidiary processes open to the Hatha Yogi. So it's possible to extend it and emphasize it and secure it. One thing is to have it as a one-time flash of experience. Other is to secure it, to stabilize it. Unless it is stabilized, you cannot have a new equilibrium with which a new creative action in the world is uh, will not be possible if the new equilibrium is not established. For many people, what happens is when the Kundalini awakens, it is so powerful an experience, it destabilizes them. Even a little of stirring up of the energy, the electric shock that is rising up through the spine is enough to shake up, to invoke fear, anxiety, tension, all that restlessness, all that happens. Therefore, in these practices, it's always necessary to purify first so that you're capable of holding the high current. And not just in one flash, but eventually to stabilize the current and its ascending force so that one can act in the world from the new equilibrium that is established. And Hatha Yogins need to ensure that that is secured and established. The results of Hatha Yoga are thus striking to the eye and, in, and impose easily on the vulgar or physical mind. The results of Hatha Yoga, because it is showing certain magical powers, it is very striking to the ordinary human mind. Because it's very visible. Stuff like stopping the heartbeat or levitation or all these things, or all this robust health and long lifespan, all that are very, very striking. So therefore, it is very, very impressive to the ordinary human mind. He's referring to the physical mind here. Physical mind is the mind that is turned towards the physical nature and bound within its physical frame, physical reality. And uh, so thus, the results of Hatha Yoga are thus striking to the eye and impose easily. It imposes and it is very impressive easily on the vulgar or physical mind particularly when people are bringing in the powers of you know, materialization, dematerialization, because there is a mastery over the material nature, the taking out of the ashes or all kinds of things that uh, many people do. These things impresses the ordinary physical mind and uh, it's very, very striking. The results of Hatha Yoga are thus striking to the eye and imposes easily on the vulgar or physical mind. And yet, at the end, we may ask what we have gained at the end of all this stupendous labor. That's a question he is asking here. At the end, we may ask what we have gained at the end of this stupendous labor. Hatha Yoga is not a path that is easy. It requires tremendous labor to acquire the siddhis, the physical siddhis that Hatha Yoga offers. Most people stay at the level of first level of perfection, that is health and fitness. But going beyond that into the awakening of Kundalini and extraordinary powers, that requires an extraordinary labor, a stupendous labor. So he's asking, what did we gain with that labor? The object of physical nature, the preservation of the mere physical life, its highest perfection, even in a certain sense, the capacity of a greater enjoyment of physical living have been carried out on an abnormal scale. So there is a object of physical nature, which is preservation of the bodily life. Nature already intends to preserve bodily life and it has given a certain lifespan. Now, Hatha Yoga 
enables us to extend this lifespan tremendously. But is that all that we can look for? The object of physical nature, the preservation of the mere physical life, its highest perfection, even in a certain sense, the capacity of a greater enjoyment of physical living, enjoyment of the normal physical living, have been carried out on an abnormal scale. That is one of the accomplishments. Is that enough? That's the question. But the weakness of Hatha Yoga is that its laborious and difficult processes make so great a demand on the time and energy and imposes so complete a severance from the ordinary life of men that the utilization of these results for the life of the world becomes either impracticable or is extraordinarily restricted. So those who are taking the path of Hatha Yoga find themselves so occupied with this journey, with this accomplishments or with this attempt to accomplish, they don't really have time to really get back upon life and engage with life and its complexity because each life context requires its own learning and mastery. And what you have mastered in terms of your perfect health or some of the physical siddhis and skills, they are not so much applicable to the normal life context and its action other than showing some magic displays. So the weakness of Hatha Yoga is that its laborious and difficult processes make so great a demand on the time and energy and impose so complete a severance, it demands you to separate, impose so complete a severance from ordinary life of men that utilization of its results for life of the world. So the result that you get, how to utilize for the life of the world, becomes either impracticable or is extraordinarily restricted. Because you have worked with the body and its cities. By itself, even coming back to life is difficult because you have to spend most of the time to retain the Siddhi and spend most of the time in that effort. And in that process, you are separated from mainstream life. You cannot really come back and engage with the complexity of life. So that's one of the major restrictions and limitations of Hatha Yoga. If in turn, for this loss, we gain another life in another world within the mental, the dynamic, these results could have been acquired through other systems, through Raja Yoga, through Tantra, by much less laborious methods and held on much less exacting terms. So on one hand, you lose the ability to engage with the worldly life and master that life. If we argue that, on the other hand, this person who thus awakens their powers, they have a rich inner life, whether it is rich inner mental or dynamic life, Sri Aurobindo is saying these results could have been acquired if it is about inner realizations, they could have been acquired by much simpler methods of Raja Yoga or Tantra, which takes less time and which is less exacting in its terms. So, why we ended up spending so much of time and energy to acquire physical cities, which is not so much applicable, usable in everyday life context, because your full time is occupied with developing the cities and retaining the cities and all that you can have is a rich inner life, then that could have been accomplished by Raja Yoga or Tantra. Why go for this? That is his question. If in return for this loss, this loss is loss of mastery over a normal social life, we gain another life in another world within the mental, the dynamic, these results could have been acquired through other systems 
through Raja Yoga, through Tantra, by much less laborious methods and held on much less exacting terms. On the other hand, the physical results, increased vitality, prolonged youth, health, longevity are of small avail if they must be held by us as misers of ourselves apart from the common life for their own sake, not utilized, not thrown into common sum of world's activities. If we hold some of these siddhis and accomplishments for ourselves, it is practically like being misers who are not able to pour into life of the world with those powers and siddhis that you accomplish, whether it is youth, longevity, even to propose that you can live 150 years or 200 years with Hatha Yoga, but you have to dedicate your whole life to extend the lifespan. That's not something we can propose to the society because life has other needs than having a long lifespan. It is just a basic condition. Life is a lot more than that. So on the other hand, the physical results, increasing vitality, prolonged youth, health, longevity are of small avail if they must be held by us as misers of ourselves, apart from common life, for their own sake, not utilized not thrown into common sum of world's activities. So here comes his final statement about Hatha Yoga. Hatha Yoga attains large results, but at an exorbitant price and to very little purpose. It gains tremendous physical mastery, but it is of little use in terms of purpose in the world. And you have to pay an exorbitant price of your whole life focusing on these processes, kriyas, efforts, asanas, pranayamas, postures, all that to hold the siddhi. Because if you stop your practices, the siddhis fade away. So you need to retain them. So your time goes into that. So therefore, the very purpose for collective life, it is of very little use. Even the accomplishments are incredible. Hatha Yoga attains large results, but at an extraordinary price and to very little purpose. So that's the challenge with the Hatha Yoga. But we need to remember one thing. The pure Hatha Yogins are not found these days. Largely what we see is a mixture of practices of some asanas, some pranayama, some meditation, some mix, of, mix of Raja Yoga, all that for a normal healthy life. It is very rarely we find people who take this up for a deeper journey, purely from a Hatha Yogic angle, to develop the physical longevity, extraordinary longevity, or the Siddhis. That is very rare, hardly found, and there is a valid reason for it. So Hatha Yoga attains large results, but at an extra exorbitant price and to very little purpose. Very striking sentence, very striking conclusion. So with that, let's end today's episode. Thank you for your time. Please subscribe and keep in touch. See you in the next episode.